Okay, so in this video, we are exploring the physiological basis of stress. Um, so if you think back to chapter three, when we spoke about the nervous system, we spoke about the autonomic branch of the nervous system, which is responsible for our automatic processes um, in the body, such as, you know, heart beating, digestion, um, physiological processes we are not consciously controlling. Um, and we then spoke about the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, which are the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, I apologize, we're having work done in the backyard right now, so I'm sorry if it's noisy. Um, so the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is what's responsible for our fight or flight response or freeze, which we'll get to in a second. Um, and then the parasympathetic nervous system is what becomes activated once that stressor is out of the way and everything starts returning back to normal. Um, so just to recap, what is happening when we are in this state of stress or when our sympathetic nervous system um, becomes activated in response to a stressor, that then causes epinephrine and norepinephrine to be released from the adrenal glands. And that causes these physiological changes that we associate with fight or flight that we've spoken about before. Um, I just want to mention that sometimes, I think I've mentioned this before, epinephrine and norepinephrine can also be called adrenaline and noradrenaline. So you may see it worded that way and it's the same thing. Um, now, I just want to talk a little bit about the history of where this idea of fight or flight came from, because it's something that I'm sure many of you have heard even before psychology. So Walter Cannon was a physiologist who was the first to identify the body's physiological reactions to stress in the early 20th century. Um, he was the very first to articulate the and name the fight or flight response. Um, and he suggested that this is a built-in mechanism that stabilizes physiological variables at levels optimal for survival. So in other words, our fight or flight response is a set of physiological reactions that occur when we are experiencing some kind of a perceived threat, um, and that those physiological reactions put the body in a in its best state for survival. It's preparing it to survive. Um, this is an adaptive response. It it's helping our species, or helps it helps many species survive. You're not the only one with a fight or flight response. Um, it's preparing of us to either fight or run away from the perceived threat. Obviously nowadays, most of the stresses we deal with are psychological and we might not need to actually run away from them or fight them. Um, but over time, this response has evolved and once upon a time it was for those reasons. Um, we, when our ancestors had many more physiological threats to deal with. Um, but these responses still show up even if we're not actually fighting or actually running away, it just they show up a little bit differently. And we will discuss that in a little bit. Um, but first of all, one thing that Cannon didn't mention is a third survival mechanism, and that is the tendency to freeze. So think about it this way. If you were in the jungle and you came across a tiger, you definitely wouldn't want to fight it. Um, you could run, but that's going to bring attention to yourself and the tiger will run after you and they are going to be faster than you. So the best response is actually to try to stay calm and not move. Now, or in other words, freeze. That doesn't mean when we freeze that we actually necessarily stay calm, um, but it does involve a tendency to completely freeze up in response to a threat or a challenge. So you um, tend to hear about people responding this way um, in rape victims and unfortunately people have a tendency to say well you know if that happened to me i would run away or i'd fight back and the reason that the people don't do that quite often is because their automatic physiological response is to freeze okay that doesn't mean they're choosing to freeze this is an automatic physiological response that they are not controlling um, so it doesn't matter really how much you say you would act a certain way in a certain situation, because when you're in that situation, your body responds extremely quickly, and that's then the driving force for your response. Now, this theory of water cannons explains what happens to our body in fight or flight, um, and some of the biological changes that cause it. But the next question is, what is actually going on in our minds when this happens? Um, one thing that happens is that when we go into fight or flight, all of our blood is rushing, is being 
being diverted from the brain and rushing um, to our limbs. So that lack of blood um, in the brain is part of what makes it extremely difficult to concentrate or to think straight um, when you are in this heightened state of stress. Um, but there are some other reasons that we experience that. Um, and there are some other cognitive changes that we often experience in these states. Um, so again, think back to chapter three, when we spoke about the limbic system, which is involved in our emotional responses. Within the limbic system is the amygdala, which is specifically involved in processing fear and anger. So it probably does not come as a surprise that it plays a big role in our response to threats. Um, one way to think of the amygdala is like an alarm that becomes activated in response to any threat to our well-being or survival. So it is constantly scanning the environment for potential threats, and it can be very quick to assume something is a threat, even if it's not. Um, so, however, the amygdala also communicates with the prefrontal cortex. Um, and so again, if you remember back to that chapter, um, the prefrontal cortex is the part of the frontal lobe involved in our ability to think logically, to problem solve, to make decisions. Um, so most of the time, even if the amygdala thinks something is a threat, a threat, the prefrontal cortex is there to essentially kind of let it know that everything's okay and we don't need to panic. Um, however, when a threat or a challenge comes along that manages to fully activate the amygdala, it's almost as if the prefrontal cortex has step, stepped aside and that alarm starts going off. This is when our body is going into fight, flight or freeze. So the amygdala communicates with other parts of the limbic system, which then triggers that sympathetic nervous system to become activated um, and triggers the fight or flight response in our body. Now, while that is happening, it's as if the prefrontal cortex has kind of gone, on, gone offline. Um, you can imagine that the um, prefrontal cortex and the amygdala are connected via Wi-Fi. The prefrontal cortex is our internet source. That's where we have all the knowledge that we need to problem solve uh, and, and, and have all the information we need to make decisions on how to respond. And while we're in this fight or flight state, that internet connection is lost, that Wi-Fi connection is lost. And so what this would mean is if the part of our brain responsible for creative thinking, problem solving, planning, if, if that can't be accessed while this alarm is going off, then it becomes very diff difficult to respond. It becomes very difficult to make a decision on how to respond, to solve the problem, to manage the emotions that are coming up in that, in that moment, to think logically about the situation. Um, and that, again, can then also make it extremely difficult to concentrate, to focus, and, and can partly explain um, why we have a hard time thinking in those moments. Um, The good news is that there are ways we can kind of engage our prefrontal cortex or reactivate it um, so that we can feel a little bit more in control. Um, one technique that a lot of people use um, to manage emotions and stress is journaling. Um, journaling is actually an extremely effective way of organizing your thoughts in that moment. Um, and one of the reasons it, it's fairly successful is because it's activating that part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex. In order to logically put down your thoughts on paper, you need that part of your brain to, to, be, to be working. Um, so as you sit down and you try to put what's going on into words, you are activating that part. And eventually it should start to feel like you're more in control, that you can think a little bit more logically. Um, hopefully the emotional component starts to decrease. Um, and you have a much easier time thinking about the situation and problem solving and making decisions. Uh, so that's one way that you can uh, try to reactivate that prefrontal cortex. Now, the last thing on this slide that I want to talk about is what do fight, flight or freeze actually look like in modern day life? Um, like I said, we're not necessarily actually running away or fighting something or standing frozen, um, but these do show up in different ways. And, and you tend to see that people lean towards one or, a couple, or maybe two of them more than um, another. So for example, I tend to go into flight or freeze. Um, 
as we go through these, you might start thinking of people that come to mind where you're like, yep, that person definitely goes into fight or yep, that person definitely tends to, to freeze in situations, stressful situations. Um, but the main thing I want you to think about is how you respond because understanding which one of these you tend to go towards can help you in responding to stress. It can help you understand, okay, I have this tendency to freeze. So when I'm feeling stressed, maybe I need to get up and go for a walk. Maybe I need to do some yoga, something to get myself moving again. Um, but let's start with fight. So people tend to go into a state of fight when they feel like they have the ability to overpower the stressor. Um, but the way it can show up, obviously we're talking about fight here, so it shouldn't be um, surprising that you tend to see anger, maybe aggression. Um, you see the, a lot of irritation, um, frustration about things. You tend to see people, they tense up. Um, just like you would if you were gonna, about to fight, your muscles would start tensing up. So if you experience a lot of muscle tension when you're stressed, maybe that's a sign that you um, go into fight. Um, we also, this could be linked to impulsivity, kind of lashing out or engaging in behaviors without fully thinking about them. With flight, the big one here is avoidance, right? You're running away from something, you are avoiding it. So again, maybe you're not actually running away, but if you avoid your stresses or things that are um, causing you a lot of anxiety, that's an example of flight. Um, you tend to see um, when people go into flight a lot of restlessness, especially in the legs. All the blood is flowing to, to the legs to, to help you prepare to run. Um, and actually, this is one of the reasons that exercise is so useful um, and is so um, beneficial in terms of helping with stress and anxiety. You've got all this energy in your limbs that need a way out. So when you're actually in this um, heightened state of stress, if you can exercise, if you can get moving, that's going to help to release some of that energy. Um, and similarly, uh, you'll see people get more fidgety. Um, they might talk about feeling kind of trapped. Um, their body just has this feeling that needs to move. Um, you see anxiety. So whereas fight is more of an anger response, flight is more of an anxious response. Um, you might see that people sleep too much. That's a form of avoidance. Um, people use alcohol and drugs, again, as a way to avoid, maybe not the stressor itself, but as a way to deal with or avoid the emotions related to that stress. Um, similarly, you'll see people overeat or undereat for the same reasons. Um, you might use various distraction techniques when you're feeling stressed. You, uh, as soon as you notice that stressor, um, you find ways to distract yourself from it. Um, you'll also find that when people are in a state of flight, they may tend to avoid responsibilities um, or depend on other people a little bit more. Um, again, avoiding the stressor or avoiding anything that could increase that level of stress. And then freeze, we've also spoken a, a tiny bit about. Um, one of the things you'll hear people say when we talk about freeze is that it kind of feels like you're numb. Um, you may not really feel any emotions in that you might just feel you know completely numb without any emotions or you might feel so many emotions that you just feel crippled by them and you just don't know what to do with them and you and you freeze um others will describe it as a kind of sense of heaviness um typically you'll f people will talk about having a hard time concentrating um hard time problem solving um because it's not just physically that you freeze it almost feels like mentally you freeze too like you just shut down um, and it becomes very hard to feel motivated to do things um, and to focus and concentrate. Um, you'll also find that when people go into a state of freeze, they may be more likely to disconnect themselves from people or, or from things they usually like doing. Maybe, maybe they start to isolate themselves, if this, especially if this is ongoing stress. Um, uh, you might see that people start to pull away, start to alienate themselves. Um, and that could be a sign of being in a state of freeze and as I mentioned just completely shutting down okay I think that is we'll stop here and I'll move on to the rest in another video